to Bookends Online Edition, produced by the Wadena County Historical Society and Travel and Story Cellar in collaboration with the New York Mills Regional Cultural Center. Bookends is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Five Wings Arts Council, thanks to a legislative, legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Bookends programs from previous authors are now available on the website of the Wadena County Historical Society at www.wadenacountyhistory.org. Today's program will also be available on the website shortly. This month's speaker is David La Rochelle. David considers himself a lucky man to get to make his living writing and illustrating books for young people. Lately, he's been working on a beginning reader series illustrated by Mike Winnetka. The book, How to Apologize, is a new picture book for children scheduled for release in May 2021. Next month's bookend will be Saturday, May 8th, it will feature Julie Severson. If you have questions for today's author, feel free to enter them through chat. If you'd like to order books, you may do so through our bookseller, Travelin Story Seller at gmail.com. Now, let's welcome to Bookends Online, David La Rochelle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gillette. And thank you, Lina, as well, too, and the Wadena Historical Society for, for inviting me to chat with you today. Um, I've, oh, the last time I was in Wadena was, I believe, in 2017. I visited the Wadena uh, Deer River or Deer Creek School I, uh, and had a great visit there. I believe Lonnie Niles was the media specialist there. Is Lonnie still there? Yes, and she sent a very complimentary note about you. <laughs> I had a wonderful visit there just yeah, 2017. So uh, enjoyed visiting the kids. Well, um, I'm also a Minnesotan. I live in White Bear Lake, Minnesota and I have lived in Minnesota my whole life. And as Gillette said, I'm a children's author and illustrator, and I've been doing that for over 30 years now. Uh, and it is a job that I love. And I thought today I would share a little bit about how I wrote a couple of books, share some of my stories with you and a little bit of my writing process. And hopefully there'll be a few questions to ask as well too. And I was uh, a kid growing up, I always loved drawing. That was my favorite subject at school. And I always loved writing and making up stories. And when I was young, I knew exactly what I wanted to be. I wanted to be just like Charles Schultz, the creator of the, the Peanuts comic strip. I wanted to be a cartoonist. And as I got a little bit older into high school, um, I decided that instead of maybe being a cartoonist, I wanted to to write and perhaps illustrate books. And I went to St. Olaf College down in Northfield. And down there, I majored in art in English. And at that point, I was already thinking about being a children's book artist and writer. But I knew I had to make a, a living as well too. And I knew that wasn't, I wasn't gonna be able to make a living right away doing that. So what I planned to do was that I was going to work for Hallmark Cards. That was my dream job. I was gonna work for Hallmark Cards. I graduated from St. Olaf and I went down to Hallmark in Kansas City, Missouri for an interview. And they told me that I couldn't draw well enough to work for them. Oh, so there's my whole plans right there. My life plan's gone. What, what was I going to do next? And so I had to go to plan B. And plan B for me was to become an elementary school teacher because I've always liked working with kids my whole life. And I thought I could do that for a while before I started writing and illustrating books. Um, and now I need to tell you something else about me before I tell you how I got my first book published. I need to let you know what one of my favorite hobbies has always been. 
Um, and that has been, I have always loved entering contests and all kinds of contests. I used to enter coloring contest and then I entered jingle contest where you have to write, you know, in 25 words or less or so. The first big national contest I ever won was when I was 14 years old. It was a contest sponsored by Shasta Soda Pop. And the contest was you has to tell in 30 words or less why Shasta's 14 flavors of pop were more fun than one. That was the contest. And I remember my entry, I wrote, Shasta's fabulous 14 flavors are far more fantastic than one flat, foul, fickle flop of a flavor. They're freezy, frosty, fizzy, and far out. Finally, they're fun. I'm your fan forever. And I ended up winning the contest back when I was 14. And I think I have a picture of my prize here, but I have to share my screen if I can do that. My prize was, and let's see if you can see this, a seven minute grocery shopping spree at our local supermarket. So that is, can you see that picture there all right? Yeah, that's me when I was 14 years old. For seven minutes, I got to go to the grocery store and all the food that I could collect back in that grocery cart and bring back to the counter in seven minutes, I got to keep for free. Um, and of course, my mom had some pretty strict ideas about where I was supposed to go. She told me to go to the meat department first and I got a whole cart full of that. And here I am in the frozen food aisle, you know, stacking up on the pizzas. Well, it was a great prize to win. And as I said, I have been um, entering contests my whole life. And the reason you need to know that is because uh, when I was studying to become a teacher, I heard about a writing contest. And the contest was to write a story for kids that had to do with one of the winter holidays. And it was sponsored by The Loft here in Minneapolis. So I thought, boy, you know, I, I've always wanted to write books for kids. Um, I love contests. So I entered something for that contest. Um, and I ended up being one of the winners. So that was, that was nice. I got to read my story to a group of kids at a holiday party here in Minneapolis. But that, but that was about it. Um, I went ahead and graduated with my teaching degree and I became a fourth grade teacher in Coon Rapids, Minnesota. And then every year I used to read this story to my fourth graders at school. And my fourth graders would say, oh, that's a nice story, Mr. La Rochelle, and that made me feel good. But then one year, this story of mine was sitting on my desk at school and a teacher that I work with saw that story sitting there. She picked it up and she read it to herself. And she said, boy, David, this is a pretty good story. Have you ever thought about trying to get it published as a book? And I said, well, you know, someday I wanna get a book published, but I'm going to wait until I write something really good. And my friend said, well, well David, I, I think this story is really good. And I said, well, no, no, I wanna wait until I write something that's, that's really, really good. And she said, no, no, I, I think this is pretty good. And I said, no, no, I'm gonna wait till I, till I, I write something I'm really happy with. And then she said, well, uh, David, uh, could, I, could I have a copy of that story to, to read to my students? And I said, sure. Um, so she did that. She read it to her students, but she did something else with it as well. She also called up an editor at a publishing company here in Minnesota, Learner Publishing, and she read the entire story over the phone to the editor. Now that would be the absolute worst way to ever try and get a story published is to have your friend call up an editor on the phone and have your friend read the story to them. <clears throat> and that editor, she should have said, just you know, slam the phone down, but the editor didn't say that. The editor said, oh, that's a, a pretty interesting story, good story. You should have him send a, that story to us at the publisher, which I did. And she said she was very interested in publishing which of course I thought was very exciting until I heard the next thing. She said she had a few changes she would like me to make for the story. And let me see if I can show you that. I'm gonna try sharing my screen again. Uh, okay, and let's see here. 
Yep. This was the first page. The part that I had sent her is the typewritten part. And all the things in red pencil were the few changes she wanted me to make. So there's the first page. Here is the second page. Um, it did not look like a few to me at all. And when I visit schools and I show this to kids, all the revisions I had to do, boy, their mouths just drop open because they think when you're an adult and you write a story, it always comes out perfect the first time. Oh, and that is never, never the case. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had to go back about nine different times and rewrite this story until the editor was satisfied with it. Um, and every, when I was working on the story, I was still a fourth grade teacher and I used to read it to my students and my students would give me suggestions about the things that they liked and the things that they thought I should improve on the story. Um, and now those students are in their 40s years old and the ones I've connected with on Facebook said they still remember that and they think of the story, the book as um, the book that they helped to write. And which is true because they really did help me write it. And eventually after all these revisions, it was published as my first book, A Christmas Guest, way back in the year 1988. I was 28 years old when my first book was published. And the illustrator is a man called Martin Scoro, who also lives in Minnesota. And even though he lives in Minnesota, I have never met him. A lot of people think that the children's authors, they work with the illustrator back and forth. And that usually is not the case at all. In fact, the editors try very hard to keep the author and the illustrator separate from each other, which seems kind of counterintuitive. But the reasoning for that is that they figure that myself as an author, I do my creative job when I write the story, but the illustrator should have the freedom to be creative when they do the artwork. And they shouldn't have the author saying, oh, you should make the boy look like my nephew. And you should make the dog in the story look like this poodle here. They feel that the <clears throat> illustrators should be able to be creative with the story. So with this book, I didn't get to see any of the illustrations until the book was just about published. So of course I was waiting pretty nervously to, to hopefully like the illustration and I did end up liking them quite a bit. And I would like to go ahead and read the story to you even though it's not Christmas now. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that if you don't mind. And I'm gonna show off Martin Scoro's uh, very, very nice illustrations. Uh, the first page of the story, however, is actually my very favorite page. And it is this page, it is the dedication of the book. And I dedicated the book to Kathy Hawbrick. And I'm wondering if you can figure out who Kathy Hawbrick is. And Gillette's nodding her head like she knows who it is. Your best friend, uh, your friend, the, the teacher that called the editor? Exactly, yep. She was a teacher that I worked with because without Kathy sending that story in, I would probably still to this day be telling myself, well, I'm gonna wait till I write something that's just really, really good. Uh, you can spend your whole life waiting until you do that perfect thing. But fortunately, I had a friend who gave me that nudge even when, even when I was reluctant to it. So I'm sure glad I could dedicate my first book to her. And this is how the story goes with uh, Martin Scoro's great illustrations. One cold and blowy Christmas Eve, when I was not so old, when the wind was full of frostbite and the sky was thick with snow, I snuggled warm beneath my quilt with dreams of Christmas day until a knock at our front door swept all those thoughts away. I heard mom on the stairway and hurried to her side. The cold floor sent me hopping as my bare feet tried to hide. Mom yawned and opened up the door. We looked outside with care. Just take a guess at what you think it was I saw out there. I heard the wind, I felt the cold. I saw a tiny lady. Her face was drawn with wrinkles. She looked 70 or 80. Her legs were bare as icicles. Her hair was crowned with frost. Her coat was thin and raggedy. I guess her gloves were lost. May I come in, she asked my mom and warm my hands and toes. She winked at me and shyly said, I think I froze my nose. Mom was sleepy. I could tell she wished she were in bed. 
this lady should have knocked upon our neighbor's door instead. At last, mom smiled and said, come in and drew her in with haste, then went to light a crackly fire in our fireplace. The lady huddled near the fire, reaching toward the heat. The flames began to thaw her, her hands and warm her frozen feet. That's better now, she said to me. Her face looked warm and pink, but the blizzard's still inside me. Have you something hot to drink? Well, there was a box of cocoa that I'd hidden on a shelf, a box of thick hot chocolate I'd been saving for myself. I thought a bit, then finally said, well, I'll have to check and see. I got the box and came back in with mugs for her and me. At last, the lady took my hand and gently squeezed it tight. You're very kind, she told me, but it's time I said good night. She wrapped her coat around her and turned slowly toward the door. I caught her arm and whispered, could you stay one minute more? I opened our front closet door and climbed up on a chair and searched until I found my scarf, my favorite thing to wear. I gave it to the lady. This is soft, I said, and warm. The cold will not come near you when you go out in the storm. Merry Christmas, I wished her. She smiled at me once more. Well, Merry Christmas, she said warmly as she stepped beyond the door. The house was quiet. So was I. But then my mother said, your bedtime, dear, is long since past. You'd best get back to bed. With thoughts of our strange visitor, I headed up the stairs. But when I stopped to look outside, I saw a wonder there. Amid the whirling snowstorm and the nighttime and the cold, I saw an angel like a star, all dressed in light and gold. Her sudden brilliance lit the dark. Her presence filled the night. And there around the angel's neck, my scarf danced wild and bright. In seconds, she had vanished. Huh. I wondered what to do. I'd never had an angel visit me before. Have you? I pressed against the window. At last, I shook my head and decided that it might be best to go on up to bed. But when I reached my room, I was amazed at what I found. There on the bed, my bed, a wooden box with ribbons wrapped around. I slowly lifted up its lid, and then my eyes grew wide. A tiny angel made of gold lay glittering inside. Now, every year at Christmas time, when winter winds blow cold, I place high on my Christmas tree that angel made of gold. I sip a mug of cocoa as I gaze up at the tree and think about the angel who spent Christmas Eve with me. And that is how the story ends. Uh, and thanks to my friend, Kathy Hawbrick for, for giving me the first push there. And once I got the contract for that book, I decided to take a leave of absence from teaching and to see if I, I could make a go at writing books. And 33 years later, that's still what I'm doing. So I, I didn't end up going back to teaching. And I've had about 30 books published since then. So I feel very fortunate that I can be doing this. And I also go out and now I get to visit kids at schools like I, I did for Deer Creek. Um, so I get the best of both worlds now. I get to do the fun part of teaching without having to make report cards or, or do parent conferences. So I, what could you ask for better than that? <clears throat> well, uh, the question that I probably get, well, there's a couple of questions I get asked the most. If I'm visiting classrooms, the question I get asked the most is if I can touch the ceiling because I'm six feet, five inches tall, and they always wanna know that if I can reach up and touch the ceiling, because I'm pretty tall. Uh, the next question I get asked the most is where I get my ideas from for stories. And I wish I had a good answer for that. All of my stories, ideas come from different places. This one, it came from a contest, having to write a story about um, uh, one of the winter holidays. But the other question I get asked a lot is just about my writing process. What is that exactly like? Um, so I thought I would share a little bit about what my, my writing process is. And actually, I'm going to share my screen again. Boy, the technology has been working so far, so I'm just going to hold my breath that it keeps working. Uh, for, for my writing, I have learned that uh, the first thing each morning that I have to do is I have to start by writing right away. Well, 
actually the first thing that I do is I will get uh, a can of Pepsi just to get me going. That's the first thing. But then after that, I am ready to check my email because I want to check my email just to make sure there's there's nothing important there that I need to take care of. But once I'm done with checking my email, then I am ready. Well, you know, if I have dishes or something to do, uh, I find that it's best to best to get away from those chores uh, because then I'll be out of my mind and then I can concentrate on my writing better. So I'll, I'll get my dishes done and then it's probably time for another snack by this point. So I will I will do that. And then I am finally ready to check my mail just in case I've gotten, you know, maybe something from my editor that is important that I should need to take care of. So I will do that. And then, <clears throat> well, as you know, in Minnesota, if we have a nice day, we really do need to take advantage of that good weather. So I will go for a walk just to get some exercise to get my, my brain going. And finally, after all of that, at last, I am ready to maybe take a, a nap just to just to get my mind right. And now this this might all sound ridiculous, but it is so so true. More than anything else in the world, I want to write books for kids and, and illustrate books. That's that's my dream job. But I can find every excuse imaginable to keep myself from doing it. And I don't know why that's the case. That's that procrastination. I can come up with a tens tens, hundreds of excuses of what I should be doing instead. So I have learned that the very first thing that I do when I get up in the morning, I have to sit down and work on my writing. Because if I just start, if I open up my email once, I'm down that rabbit hole and the day is going to be wasted. I'm, I'm going to find uh, emails that just are calling me to take care of. So my my process really is to start my day with that writing or illustrating and it might be just a couple hours that i will spend each day working on a new manuscript if i'm doing illustration i might work on it a little bit longer than that but but the key for me for my process is to do it first thing in the morning so so that is that i thought um i would share a little bit about how uh, another one of my books came to be, if that's okay. And that is my book, uh, Minnesota's Hidden Alphabet. Um, Gillette, you look, maybe you've seen this one before. And this book is has photographs by Joe Rossi. Joe Rossi lives in Black Duck, Minnesota. He is an excellent professional photo photographer. He worked for uh, the St. Paul Pioneer Press for, for many, many years. Um, and this book came about in a very different way from a lot of my stories. And once again, I'm going to jump to share the screen because I, I have a number of images to show for this. And that is this story. Uh, well, there's the cover. Started with the photographs first. Joe uh, had an idea to do a photo essay in the publication Minnesota Conservation Volunteer. Maybe some of you have seen that magazine before. It's put out by the Minnesota DNR. And he came up with the idea of doing a photo essay where he would take pictures of letter shapes that he found in nature. And he actually went all across the state of Minnesota and he looked for letter forms that he could find. He said that he took 13,000 photographs to find the 26 letters of the alphabet. And he worked on this for off and on for about, I think it was maybe a year and a half uh, trying to find photographs. And once he came up with all the letters of the alphabet and he was happy with them, they were published in uh, the magazine put out by the DNR. And it was such a popular article in the magazine that the Minnesota Historical Society decided they wanted to do a book with all of Joe's photographs. Except Joe did not want to write the text for the book. Um, and they decided that they were going to have a Minnesota children's author write the text. And I was the lucky person that they asked to do that. And that is very different for me to have an editor coming to me asking me to write a story 
because what usually happens is that I write a story and I send it to an editor and then in the mail, I get rejection letter. And this is just a stack of some of my rejection letters. Uh, again, when I visit schools, I will often show them my stack of 198 rejection letters I've received over the years. Um, and kids sometimes ask if I still get rejection letters. No, I do not get rejection letters anymore. I get rejection emails now. Um, but I, I still have all this stack of April paper rejection letters. But I didn't have to worry about it this time because the editor came to me asking me to write the story. And it was a little bit uh, a challenge to think of uh, writing the text for an alphabet story because as you can see, here's the photo that Joe did for the letter A. And usually in an alphabet story, you have a is for apple and there's a picture of an apple or A is for airplane and there's a picture of an airplane. Joe's photograph of that A there, it is not a picture of something that starts with the letter A, it's just that shape. So I was trying to think about how, how I could formulate this for an alphabet book. And I decided that I wanted to end up writing a poem where each line of the poem would start with a different letter of the alphabet. And that would be the connection to Joe's photographs there. So I'm not gonna go ahead and read the whole story, but I'll show a couple of the, the first pages from the book. And the book starts like this. All across this wondrous state, letters A through Z await. By a brook, beside a hill, Camouflaged with cunning skill, deftly drawn in woody glades, even etched in blowing blades. So that's how it starts. Um, and I knew that even though my uh, poem, each letter of start, each line of the poem showed matched up with the letter people were gonna still be interested in those photographs and they were gonna to wanna to know more about them because my poem really doesn't say what those photographs are. So I decided to come up with these sidebars there. I know, let's see if I can go back one. Yep. For example, uh, for the letter D, you have this shape here and that is actually a shelf fungus is what it is. And I bet if you've gone out walking the woods, you've seen it. Um, usually it's it going the opposite direction. Joe took his photograph looking down on it, but it looks like a little bit of a shelf. And as I was researching shelf funguses, one of the interesting things I found about them is that they are like trees. Every year, they add another ring to them. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, that little arrow there. But yeah, so you can tell how old one of these fungi are by counting the rings, just like you would count uh, the rings inside a tree. So each of these uh, photographs have a little sidebar that gives some information about it. Here for this antler that Joe found for the letter C. I didn't know this, but I, I've heard hunters are familiar with it, but the animals eat those antlers. Like mice will eat those antlers to get calcium. It helps their teeth and I had no idea. So each of these uh, photographs, I came up with a little a fact that would go along with it. And, oh, I, I'm, as I'm, again, I'm not gonna read the whole book, but I would, wanted to show you my favorite photograph of all the ones that Joe took. My favorite was his W photograph. And I thought that was just gorgeous. And when you look at it, it looks exactly like a W and what a, a the photographer's eye to have to spot that. That is actually a trout lily. And the reason it's called a trout lily doesn't look like a trout here, but if you would look at the base of this flower, the, the bottom leaves are speckled like a trout and that's where it comes with its name. Um, I showed you with my story of Christmas guest all the revisions that I had to do with this particular book, Joe took all the photographs. I had absolutely nothing to do with the photographs, but there was one photo that Joe had taken that I was thinking to myself, you know, I don't think kids are going to be able to spot what letter that is. And this was the photo that originally Joe had. It's a beautiful photo. I'm wondering if you can guess what letter you think that is. You have a, a guess? Gillette maybe, or Laura, or? Yeah. 
Jay? Yeah, no, that's what um, uh, Linus said too, Jay. No, it was not a J. Yeah, that's what I thought it was too. Does it, can you see what other letter it is? Because I could not. It is actually, Joe thought, the letter S, like a script S, if you were to draw oh. a small S. Yeah, and I didn't see that at all. Uh, it's a beautiful photograph, and I don't know if you can tell what it's a photo of, but it's a photo of birch bark looking down on it and, you know, and how birch bark curls. And even though it was a great photo, I said, you know, I don't think little kids are going to be able to see the letter S in there. So Joe was kind enough to use another photo. Um, and this was the S that he came up with, which seems a lot clearer too. And that is a bittersweet vine that he found. Um, and that's what he ended up using. And one thing that I like about this book is, oh, I'm gonna go back to stopping sharing my screen, is that it really encourages families to go outside and look at nature. Uh, when I was finished with this book, then I went on vacation and I found myself with my camera trying to photograph letters and all the things that I saw. And it's a great activity to do with your family, to get outside and look around and see if you can spot any letters you might see? Can you spot enough letters to make uh, your name or your last name or something like that? So, so hopefully it will encourage kids to do that. Again, Joe's photographs are, are beautiful in this book. And this book still is in print. Uh, Christmas Guest has been out of print for a long time, but this book through the Minnesota Historical Society is, is still in print. Um, and there's, I wanted to show uh, share another one of my books, if I could, my book Moo, because this is very different from how uh, uh, Minnesota's Hidden Alphabet came across. And for this book, I do know exactly uh, how I got the idea. There were two things I had in mind. One thing I had in mind was uh, I wanted to write a book that used just one word, that told the whole story using one word. That was my idea. And when I was trying to think of the word I should use, um, I came up with the word moo and I came up with that word partly because of this. Do you recognize what that is? Uh, yep, oh, Laura knows what it is, yeah. Can you show with your hands what you would do with this, Laura? Do you know? Eggs, yeah. Yep, and then, oh no, it's not a mug, but, it is actually one of those noisemakers. You turn it over and it makes that mooing sound. Yep, exactly. My friend Gary had given that to me as a Christmas gift many years ago. Um, and then he got one himself. And he would, I, I named this noisemaker Bossy. And Gary named his noisemaker uh, Daisy. And we'd be talking on the phone and I would make up stories like, oh, Bossy is in the kitchen making popcorn now. And Daisy would, uh, Gary would make up stories about Daisy. And I always tell people, if you don't have kids or if you don't have pets, you will start making up stories about inanimate objects, which is what Gary and I were doing. But anyway, uh, I decided on the word moo and I tried to tell a whole story just using that one word. And I made a little practice book. And these are the first pages of the dummy that I made. Moo. Moo. And moo as the cow jumps into the car. And I like this idea a lot. And I wanted to be the illustrator for this book as well, too. So I did a sample painting using acrylic paints. But boy, the cow just wasn't quite the way I wanted her to look. So I tried using some gouache paints. But no, you know, that, that cow didn't look the way I wanted it to either. So then I tried using. Uh, can you recognize that medium there? It is actually uh, the computer. I tried doing some artwork there, but I still wasn't happy with the, how the cow was coming out. And right about this time, I got a postcard in the mail from a friend of mine who was having an art show. And excuse me, the postcard looked like this. When I saw that cow, I thought that is how I would like the cow to look in the book. That's exactly what I want the cow to look like. And that postcard belonged to my friend, Mike Winutka, 
who was also a member of my critique group, my writing group. And I asked Mike if he would be interested in illustrating this book. And Mike said, moo, which I took to mean, yes, he did want to illustrate it. And usually, as I was saying, authors and illustrators very seldom, they don't even, lots of times they don't even know each other. And they definitely do not want the author of the book to try and go out and find his or her own illustrator. Editors don't want that. But Mike is a professional illustrator and he's done books before. And we thought maybe if we sent my little practice book along with a painting of the cow to an editor, maybe an, we sent it to an editor that Mike had worked with before, maybe they would allow us to do the book together. So we did that. We sent it to an editor that Mike had worked with and they said, yes, uh, the two of you can do the book together. And that became the book Moo. Although even when Mike was working on the illustrations, they told him, please don't show any of your sketches to David, even though you're in the same writing group. Please send all of your sketches to us here in New York. We'll look at them and then we'll decide which ones to send to David. And if David have comments, then he can email us to New York and then we'll give those comments back to Mike. So even though we were here in the same cities, we couldn't talk with each other. And here is how Mike's first couple of pictures look like. Oh, first of all, I should show who the book was dedicated to. I dedicated it to Bossy and Daisy, those two noise makers that my friend Gary and I have. And the beginning of the book goes like this, moo, moo, moo. And you can see that Mike's illustrations are the perfect fit for the book. I'm so glad to, that he worked on with it. Now you would think with a one word book like this, there couldn't be many revisions to the writing, uh, but there was. For example, the editor wanted me to change the title of the book. This is what I had for the title, Moo. And do you know what they wanted it change to? They wanted it to change to have an exclamation mark on it with moo there. I had a period before. And when I had a period, Mike had drawn a cover of the cow just standing out in a field. And it was a great picture, but when they changed the title to have an exclamation mark, the cow out in the field no longer makes sense. So Mike had to come up with a different picture. So he had the cow in the car. And isn't that more exciting than what was had before if it had just been out in the field? So the, deaf, the editor was right in changing the title. Here was something else the editor wanted to change. I had this scene in the book, moo. And my editor told me, no, no, you cannot have that in the book, David. And do you know why the editor told me that? She said, that is just too dangerous for kids. That'll be too, that'll, that'll bother two kids too much. Uh, Kyle going off the cliff. And I thought to myself, well, I already have a book about a cow driving a car. Kids are gonna think that this is an imaginary book. I, I, I think they could handle this, but no, the editor said, nope, I couldn't have that, it's too violent. So this is the solution that Mike and I came up with. She just hits a rock and she goes flying, moo. And they thought that that was fine. So, so that, well, one of the fun things that uh, happened with that book is that after it was published, it was chosen for a program here in Minnesota called the One Book. Uh, uh, it was called uh, Once Upon a Reader. It was the first book. And Mike and I were asked to visit 59 libraries across the state of Minnesota and give a program based on that book. And I know we visited Wadena back in 2015. And this was one of the things that we brought on our tour to all the preschoolers there was a puppeteer, Wayne Crafting made a puppet of the cow Moo from the book. And I thought Wayne really did a good job of making the cow puppet look like Mike's illustrations. So cow has gone with us to all the different 59 libraries across the state that we visited. And, oh, yeah. yeah cow usually wants it. She has a joke she wants to tell all of you. So go ahead, cow. Moo, 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 moo. Uh, why did the cow cross the road? 
No, Gillette, you don't know, like you, you don't think you know the answer. To get some milk. Oh, that, that makes sense. Is that the answer to get some milk? Oh, I think, I think you'll have to tell us, go. Moo, 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 moo. To get to the other side. Ah, very funny, Kyle. Um, well, you've told your joke. I think I'm going to have you set off to the side over there. And well, the, the last two things to show quickly, um, you had mentioned a little bit, Gillette, the, the new books I have coming out. Uh, Mike Winutka and I, the Moo was our first book, but we've been lucky to go on and do several other books together. This past spring, we had, there it is, See the Cat, three stories about a dog. And we were so delighted and honored this past uh, end of January when the American Library Association uh, honored us with the Theater Seuss Geisel Award for our book for the best book for beginning readers. And it was a huge, huge honor for us. Uh, I'm gonna just share the screen again. And so there's the cover of the book with Mike's great illustration. And I'll just show the first couple pages. Um, see the cat. I am not a cat. I am a dog. See the blue cat. I am not blue. And I am not a cat. The blue cat is in a green dress. I do not have a green dress. And the story goes on with a uh, kind of an argument between the dog and the book. Uh, the cat's name is Baby Cakes. That is not my name. My name is Max. Um, see the blue cat in a green dress riding a pink unicorn. There is no cat. There is no dress. There is no unicorn. There's just me, Max, the dog. Uh, well, it turns out that there actually is a cat, a dress, and a unicorn. And that's the first story. And then there's two other stories. Again, this is for kids who are just beginning to read. And Mike and I have heard so many nice uh, compliments about kids who, the, this is the first book they can read on they own, their own, and they think it's very funny. Uh, so it's nice to create a book that young readers actually like. And Let's see, go on to the, and the next book that we have coming out just in a couple weeks is a book called How to Apologize. It is so new, I don't even have a copy yet. Um, and I do know the exact moment I came up with the idea for this book. I was uh, uh, visiting a counselor. We were talking about apologizing and he said two things. He said, when you apologize, you say you're sorry for what you did, then if possible, you try to fix the mistake if you can. And I started thinking about that and I began paying attention to how people apologize. And I learned really quickly, people are not very good at apologizing. And just myself, I learned that I'm not very good at apologizing. If you start listening, people will, will say things like, oh, I am sorry that you feel bad about what happened. And that's not really apology. You're, you're saying you're sorry that the person feels bad. You're not apologizing for what you did. Or I find myself saying this, I am sorry, but the reason I did that, then you give an excuse for what you did. So you're not really apologizing. So this book is just very simple uh, tips on how to apologize. But as I was writing down those tips, I was thinking in my head, what would be funny ways in which they could be illustrated with animals? Um, and I did a dummy of the book, some sketches, and Mike did the final artwork. I knew right from the beginning, I wanted him to be the artist. And here are the first couple pages. Everyone makes mistakes. Whether you are big or small. And when you've made a mistake that has hurt someone or something, the right thing to do is apologize. And this is another example of Mike's artwork is just wonderful. I'm so happy he was the illustrator. And, and I'm very curious to see how the book will be received because it isn't even out yet. And I think I'm finally going to stop sharing my screen now. And I have just gone on and on. And I'm wondering, uh, Gillette, if 
you have any questions or uh, Lina has any questions. I know Laura had to step out, but any final questions for this last bit of time here? This is the most delightful presentation that I've seen. <laughs> well, Kyle will be happy to hear that. She, she always uh, enjoys being on camera. I, if, I have to worry because she will just come in and she will, she will take over the whole presentation. So. So any questions for me or for Kyle? Well, I, I, how was it, I mean, you've been writing for 30 years. Have you seen how uh, the different demands, the pub, what the kind of voice that publishers want from children's authors, like the Christmas uh, guest was rhyming couplets, you know, four line stanzas per page, which was, you know, 30 years ago, I, I think that was pretty much all children's books and I, I mean the really good children's books I feel are designed to be read aloud so that they're enjoyable for everyone and then look at um, you know see the cat where the the book is a character or there's this off voice it's almost like a, a way of breaking the fourth wall and, and we saw this start to emerge as a, a way of doing children's books um, just a few years ago. And I've been struggling to remember. It was like the, uh, the, the pencils, the colors, the crayons. That was, I think, the first one that I saw. Yeah. Well, I, uh, boy, you, you made a lot of great comments there, Gillette. First of all, the whole idea about rhyming children's books. I know that when I started, that's what I thought children's books. We think of Dr. Seuss and their rhyming books. Um, and that's, and I thought that would be more appealing to kids. The one advice that editors give for people who are just starting out is to not write a rhyming book because it's, it's very hard to do it well. A lot of uh, beginning manuscripts where they're written in rhyme, the, the rhyme is forced and it doesn't feel very natural. And that was the critique when this book was published, when it was reviewed, uh, one of the reviews pointed out that the rhyme was not real, did not flow real smoothly and that there were clunky sparks in there. So after I got that review, I did not write another rhyming book again until 20 years later. And I, uh, it was, this was the only other rhyming book that I did. And I worked so hard to make the rhyme go nice and smoothly with this one. So I was, I was a better writer at that point. But, um, you know, a lot of people think that children's books have to rhyme and, and they don't. And I think you see that now where there is a wide, much wider range of books. They don't always rhyme. That whole uh, breaking the, 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 the fourth wall, that those metafictive meta books is what they're called. You do see that a lot more now with children's books. That has been sort of a, a trend recently. Um, another difference that I noticed from with editors is, and this is a good change, is that there is a big push to have books with uh, diverse characters and also to have diverse authors as well too. I mean, when I was growing up and you would look at the children's books and all the characters in the book were white. That was, that was just the way all the books were. Um, you would be hard to find a book that would have a character uh, with, without, uh, without a non-white character. And now publishers are, are, are finally to wise up where they're very actively seeking out authors of, of different backgrounds. And if you look at the new books coming out now too, you can see characters of a wide range that represent the, the population of our country now because we are not just a white uh, population. So that's a huge change that I see. Um, another change is that I hear editors wanting for picture books, shorter texts. Um, that the longer picture book story that we might have read when we were younger, um, the parents now want really short books, like 500 words or less. There are exceptions to that, but I, I know that's something that editors are looking for. And sadly, a lot of parents are trying to get their kids out of picture books. Uh, read picture books, and as soon as you can read on your own, you should be reading something longer. I think that's a shame because there are so many beautiful picture books that can be enjoyed by kids who are in second, third, fourth. As adults, there are some wonderful picture books that I love to read. 
And even if your kid can read a longer book, that doesn't mean they shouldn't be reading picture books anymore. That was actually one of the, the consistently saddest moments when I had the brick and mortar bookstore is when parents would come in and box their kids in to say, oh, you're, you're too old to read those books or you need to have a certain reading level or get points and, or, and, or I won't get those books for you. And I, I mean, I, I'm of the opinion that if, if, if they're reading, it, who cares if they enjoy the reading and there is just as much reading from the pictures as from, so you should never stop reading picture books and truly amazing children's picture books that have something that engages the reader, the adult, as well as the child so that every time you read to the child and which I find in yours, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> we'll toss in an offhand compliment there. <laughs> and I think it was uh, uh, maybe W.H. Auden who said this. Uh, I might have the, the, the speaker wrong, but I think he said that there are some books written for adults that are only appropriate for adults, but, uh, but a good children's book is appropriate for all ages uh, because there are things that you can find in it, just like you said, Gillette. Uh, when you read it when you are five years old, you can find something else in it when you are 15 or 50 years old or, or older than that. And some of them are just lovely language books, just, just the language is beautiful. Or the, there are picture books like Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus that I read and I still laugh out loud. It is just a funny book, no matter what age you are. I always I liked that would... Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> I love reading Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Some of those books, there's a reason why they're classics. You know. I, I would always try to pigeonhole my customers and pull picture books out and be like, oh, let me read this to you. I, you are so going to enjoy this book. And they miss, I think, some of the texture of the book if they're just introduced to it you know, see the pictures, read this, re read some of the words. But if you read the book to them and they have somebody present the book that way out loud, they're, they, they become engaged and enamored in, in a totally new way. And as you said before, July, picture books are meant to be read out loud. Um, and it's a bonding experience when, when you read that book with your child it's uh, you share that experience together and i've also heard it said uh, that you should not stop reading to your children and that there are i know parents who read to their kids all the way up through their seniors in high school they share books together that way and that the 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 kid the and the adult have that experience of having read you know a longer book together and share that story no matter what it is oh, you know, and I know adults who like to read books to each other, couples who read books together when they're on a trip. And again, that bonding experience, reading a book aloud with someone. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. Well, I had a, a wonderful time sharing my stories with you. You were a great audience. I appreciated that. Any, any final questions? I don't know if Lina has one or Gillette, no? Well, we hope that you can come back physically to Wadita at some time. Uh, lots of new things have happened, uh, one of which is that I moved to Wadita. I'm having so much fun working here. I decided to move here. And um, you'll, find some, you'll find some fun inspirations. As I said, I had a wonderful visit at the school there. Uh, and I, I'd be very happy to be able to return again sometime. Great. We'll try to work on that. Thank you so much. Thank and you. Thank you, Gillette. Thank you very much. You're welcome.